What do you think of this? How fair and pleasant you have become, O oh lover, delectable maiden. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say, I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. Oh, your breasts are like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath is like apples, and your throat is like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. When was the last time you heard this read in church? <laughs> mm, it's probably been quite a while. Have you personally had a chance to read the Song of Songs? Yes, all right. What's your imp hmm? What's the Armenian? What's your impression of it? <laughs> In Armenian, it sounds more conservative. All right. <laughs> um, mm. Anybody else want to venture an opinion? How does it strike you when you read it? Very erotic. Very erotic, indeed. It's poetry. Yes, it is. If you feel that it's a little bit surprising to find it in sacred scripture, then you join centuries of other people before you who have shared that same kind of puzzlement. What place, after all, does a piece of openly, unabashedly erotic love poetry replete with sensual imagery have in scripture? It's really an obvious question. And puzzlements and questions, obvious or not obvious, medieval Armenian fathers felt are the doorway into learning. Whenever and wherever, it doesn't matter at what point, doesn't matter at what time in your life, you begin to question what appears on the surface in the sacred writings. Whenever your attention is arrested by something that shouldn't be there, something that is surprising to you for whatever reason, something deeper is sure to open before you when you turn aside to investigate. Think of Moses and the burning bush. If he hadn't stepped off of his planned path in order to investigate the odd phenomenon of this piece of foliage burning and yet not being consumed, he wouldn't have encountered God that day, not to mention that history would have been vastly different so the motivating force of surprise and inquiry is an underlying principle of all Armenian interaction with scripture. So perhaps it's good that we have tonight, thanks to Father Daniel, to talk for a little bit about the commentary on the Song of Songs by this man. Who is he? St. Gregory of Nautic, one of his four famous depictions. It's good that we have this evening to talk about it because after all, you have a question about it, even if you didn't know that you had a question about it before you got here this evening. So to answer the question of what all of this erotic imagery is doing in the Bible, we're going to look at the Song of Songs through St. Gregory's eyes. This 10th century mystic is one of the most beloved one of the best known, one of the most revered figures in all of Armenian spiritual and literary history. So I'm pretty sure that to many of you, he needs no introduction. We pray his prayers in the liturgy. We resonate with his lamentations privately. Some of us write theses on them. We read his work over the sick because of its healing vibrational power. And now that he has been declared a doctor of the Church of Rome, we share the riches of his deep relational understanding of the human mystery with a whole new world of people that is vastly enriched because he existed even though they weren't aware of his existence until recently. If St. Gregory needs no introduction himself, the same cannot be said for his commentary on the Song of Songs. That does need to be introduced. It's the only work 
that St. Gregory wrote that uses none of his justly famous, specially created vocabulary that he crafted word by word in order to express the inexpressible emotional experience that he had of the divine. The commentary on the Song of Songs is the only work he wrote that involves no original poetry. And contrary to the depiction that we see of him here as an old man, it was his earliest written work. Interestingly, <laughs> it was also the harbinger of things to come for him. It was the perfect place for Gregory, of all people, to have begun his public expression with the Song of Songs very accurate predictor of his future career as one of the great singers of man's love for God, in whose passionate image man was created. Well, given the nature of its subject matter, it might be a little surprising that Gregory wrote this commentary at the request of a layman. The man who asked Gregory to write this commentary for him was Prince, later King, Gurgen Khachig of Vasburagan, a large area around Lake Van. At the time that he asked Gregory to write this commentary for him, Gurgen was a young man, probably in his mid-twenties. He was the very ambitious child of a highly ambitious, even ruthlessly ambitious dynasty. On the one hand, Gurgen's family are masters of the exquisite and the creative. In the waters of Lake Van, across from Gregory's seaside monastery, which you see here, on the island of Achtamar, Gurgen's grandfather built a dynastic complex centered on the Holy Cross Church, famous. Maybe some of you have been there to see it. And he depicted himself on it. You can see him there in the center, humbly offering his building to Christ on the side of the church that people were least likely to see from the outside. So on the one hand, in Gurgen's family, there's this wonderful, creative, faithful, humble element. On the other hand, Gurgen's family also instigated more than one bloody, treacherous, and fratricidal Armenian civil war. On the one hand, Gurgen's granddaughter will become the highly sophisticated Queen of Georgia. On the other hand, Gurgen's brother gave away half of Armenia's traditional territory to the Byzantine Empire because of a verse he read in the Bible one day. <laughs> They're a very interesting bunch, Gurgen's family. But I, dig I digress. <laughs> Why? did Gurgen ask Gregory to explain the Song of Songs to him? After all, he hadn't heard it read in church any more than you have. So what must he have been doing? Yeah, he must have been doing self-study. He must have been reading it on his own. He must have approached it with an inquiring mind. And in the tradition of Armenian learning, we've already seen, an inquiring mind is the beginning of wisdom. Gregory actually seems to have had a little bit of doubt about whether he should fulfill Gurgen's request to write this for him. The colophon at the end of the work says that the prince had to ask Gregory twice for his written explanation of the song. But in the end, he persevered, proved himself, and Gregory acquiesced. The prince got his commentary. So the fact that Gurgen asked for this commentary, and the fact that he persisted long enough to actually get what he wanted says something about him. It also tells us something about Gregory. Exegesis, or explanation, of the Song of Songs was reserved only for the very most adept, the very most knowledgeable among biblical scholars, those who were least likely to find its erotic imagery merely a distraction. Hence, Gregory, who, like Gurgen, was in his 20s at the time that he wrote this work, must have already had a considerable reputation as a scholar and as a sober-minded monastic for Gurgen to approach him 
with this question, which is now our question, what does all of this erotic effusiveness mean and why is it in the Bible? Well, once you start looking at the Song of Songs as something to chew on and digest and ask about, not something to kind of read in private moments only and put it away when someone else walks in the room. In other words, once you undertake to have a real relationship with this text, there are plenty of immediate questions that arise. You can get into questions before you even get into the text itself. Just look at this. This is the heading of the, the Song of Songs in the Armenian translation. The Song of Songs, that is, the blessing of blessings, spoken by Solomon, king of Israel. Any questions come to mind? Anything you would like to know more about? Anything that strikes you as being just a little bit odd about this? What? Andrew, I see a hand. All right. Isn't that an interesting equation? A song, a blessing. What do they have in common? Other questions come to your mind even before we get into the text. Yeah, what does it have to do with the king of Israel? Michael. A song that is spoken. A song that is spoken. What's that about? Songs are supposed to be music. What else? Well, I, I would rather think it's a church story. Mm-hmm. You would wonder what's its use. Is there a context for it? Anything else strike you about just this piece before we even get into the text? Yeah, in the back. Does it have any connection with the Song of Solomon? Yes, it does. In other texts, in other editions, it's called the Song of Solomon. Just look at the first line. What strikes you about the first line? Anything unusual, odd? Anything you might want to know more about? Anything that you look at and go, oh, that's interesting. Elise? I think I would want to know what makes this the song of songs, or the blessing of all blessings. Uh-huh. All right. So if there is a song of songs, then there must be other songs. All right. So what are those? What are the other songs that this one would be the pinnacle of? The song with a capital S. What are all the songs with small s's? Can you dig some of them out of your memory? Biblical songs? The Psalms, absolutely. What else? Who else has a notable song in scripture? Hannah has a notable song. Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. Mary has a notable song. Who else? Miriam. Miriam has a notable song. Miriam singing in praise of God as the Israelites safely reach the other side of the Red Sea and are out of the reach of the Egyptians. Judith. Judith. Oh, yes, she does. <laughs> hmm. All right. Who else? Famous song. Liturgical, liturgically used song. Mm hmm absolutely. We have the song of the angels. So if we were going to look at some illustrations of these, Miriam's song, going with the earliest one, Hannah's song. What about this one? Who are these people with a song? Yes, the three young men, the three children in the book of Daniel. Who is this? Obviously. All right. And this is whose hymn? Anybody know this one? This is taken from the depiction of this hymn on a wall in a church in Jerusalem dedicated to it. It's called the Benedictus. The hymn of Zechariah the priest when his son John the Baptist was born. And this one, whose was this? 
Mary's. All right, when she learned that she would bear God's son and savior as her son. So Gregory knew that understanding the Song of Songs as the pinnacle, the culmination, the distillation of all of these songs would give Gurgen access to something that summed up and surpassed all of these songs of divine praise and blessing, all of these songs of wonder and astonishment at God's interactions with humanity in ways that surpassed anything human beings could imagine or even consider asking for. The Song of Songs includes all of them. And there it is, sitting in the Old Testament, absolutely full of erotic imagery. So what about that? But there's more that we could ask about that form that Elise pointed out, song of songs. Haven't we, aren't there other phrases, biblical things that sound kind of like that, the something of something? The something of somethings? Does it ring any bells? Lord of Lords, King of Kings. What else? What about this one? Look familiar to anyone? Holy of Holies. What is the Holy of Holies? Yeah, the very inner part of the tabernacle and then later the temple where only the holiest of designated priestly representatives ever got to actually set foot and even he could do so only rarely. And then you mentioned King of Kings, Lord of Lords, names designating whom? Mm -hmm. God himself. So the Song of Songs, just by virtue of the fact that it's called the something of somethings, must express something about the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. The Song of Songs must be his holy of holies in some way. And there that form is again. Someone else already pointed this out. What does the Song of Songs have to do with the blessing of blessings? What's the connection? What's well, very interesting? Variants of the word bless or blessing appear a thousand times in scripture. I didn't personally count them, but someone did. So, if the Song of Songs is also the blessing of blessings, then it is the summation of all 1,000 of those smaller blessings. It tops them all, singly and together. It is the quintessence and the essence of all 1,000 of them. It is what really makes all the other blessings, blessings. Really, says Gurgen? with all of that erotic imagery? Yeah, says Gregory, really. In Gregory's estimation then, the Song of Songs is the holy of biblical holies that both contains and grants access to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The love that it depicts with a capital L is more loving than all other loves. It is what makes all other loves love. It is more holy than the holiest of all imaginable things. So does that put it like the holy of holies? Off limits? Is it something only for the very special, very occasionally to access? No, says Gregory, because of course he knew his Bible well, and he knew that St. Paul tells us in his letters that whereas the temple's holy of holies was accessible only to the high priest and only once a year, now through Christ's universal high priesthood, the holy of holies is open to everyone all the time. Free access to God's highest modes of being to God's most encompassing, most concentrated presence, and to blessing that is beyond any other blessing of any other creature, is open to humanity through Christ and 
Gregory says to Gutgen, the Song of Songs is the door to it. Really? Says Gutgen. Yeah, really, says Gregory. Now, Gurgen is a military man and a politician, and he's married. Being groomed for kingly authority, not unlike Solomon. And so Gregory told him, you could, and you should, take to heart and enjoy the literal meaning of the ancient king's song of songs. It is a celebration of marital and sexual love. It is a description of the miraculous and awesome warmth and longing and connection that a couple can feel towards one another. A warmth and a love that ideally grow and deepen over time, transforming the two people into one and creating something new in them and between them and through them. The Song of Songs can be read and identified with by people in love everywhere in every age. As a universal experience, romantic love is one of the most readily accessible paths to a deeper knowledge of God and the finest, deepest realities of human nature. It is one of the holies. It is one of the blessings. In fact, as St. Gregory points out in the early part of his commentary, ever since the Garden of Eden, human beings have been consumed and uplifted and motivated by the love of love. Adam, after all, chose the love of his wife, who was part of him, over obedience to the creator who made him. The Armenian fathers were very clear about this. Unlike Eve, who was deceived, Adam knowingly disobeyed God for her because he did not want to give up the love that God had gifted him with. And this was not a bad thing, the fathers said. After all, since humans chose to leave paradise for love, God chose to offer humans a return to paradise through what? Love. Specifically, but not solely, through the love of Christ for us. And so it is that married love continues to be one of life's greatest and potentially most divine mysteries. Holy matrimony, Gregory the celibate, tells Gurgen, the married man. And the love of a groom for his bride and of the bride for her groom is free from defilement and is no stranger to the Spirit's grace. There is nothing more honorable on earth than the love of a man and a woman. And if to some people it does not seem so great or so important, this is only the case because they have either not come to marriage in a holy way, or they have not maintained their virginity in a holy way, but carelessly defiling themselves, they have put away from themselves the grace of the spirit that human love contains. This is very high praise for the married state of sexual union in a time when clerics and monastics especially are commonly supposed to have spurned the joys and the ties of human love. But there is more to the Song of Songs and the Blessing of Blessings than even the most sublime human love, worthy although that is, of divine laud and honor as one of humanity's most beautiful gifts. To be enshrined, not just in scripture, but at the pinnacle of scripture, the holy of holies of scripture, what the Song of Songs contains within it must be not just love, but the love with a capital L of all loves. In the lover's dialogue of the Song of Songs dramatic stage directions, and if you look at the Armenian version of it, you'll see that those are very clearly given before everything that is said. The bride says, the groom says to himself, the groom says to the bride, the bride says to the groom, the bridesmaids say to the bride. All of those things are clearly specified so you know who's speaking to whom. 
In all of those stage directions, it was commonplace for biblical interpreters in all the traditions to see a dialogue between God and the human soul, collective and individual. For millennia before Gregory's time, faithful people had read the song in their own voice as the beloved bride speaking to the God they loved with a passion that we today, in our emotionally impoverished culture, might be tempted to find inappropriate. Gregory told Gurgen, like generation upon generation of people before you, it is your right to declare to the world not just, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, but to say, I have found the one my soul loves. I have seized him and I will never let him go. He tells Gurgen, it is your right not just to relate to God as almighty king of the universe, but to say, my nephew exists for me and I exist for him. He is the one who pastures his flock on lilies. Beautiful though it is, to have a relationship with God that is filled with all the emotion that is the human soul's birthright, and a light with a passion that we so often lay aside in favor of rational objectivity. Gregory says to Gurgen that even this love of the human for the divine is not the love of loves with a capital L. There is a greater love. He says to Gurgen, live into your relationship with God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. Be the bride. And then listen with all of your soul's ears to what God, the groom, says to you. What happens in your life if you really truly hear God, the groom, say to you, you, me, you are beautiful. You who are so near to me, there is no flaw in you. What light does that throw on us and our life with God? How does it change our relationship to the divine if we know that God is watching us not as a judge, but as a lover? That he sees us not as poor, pathetic worms, but as dark and beautiful, ultimately desirable. What if God really wants us to know ourself as he sees us? Gregory said to Gurgen, when you look at the structure of the Song of Songs chapter by chapter, you will see that it shows us a process through which the bride, the soul, humanity, gradually does come to know herself through her lover's eyes and is elevated through his love and through loving him in return to new heights of beauty, new heights of self-understanding, new vistas of love, new expanses of enlightenment, if you prefer that word. But this elevation, this expansion of our relationship with God's love is not obligatory. The invitation is there, but God does not force anyone to respond. The song says in its beginning verses, if you don't know yourself, beautiful, among women. You can go on following the rest of the flocks. I won't force you to have a relationship with me. But if you do, you will see yourself with my eyes, not with your understanding, but with my ultimate understanding of who you are. And because the love of God will take us higher and higher forever, Gregory went on to say, <laughs> this book, this Song of Songs, not only belongs in the Bible, but it is literally the pinnacle of the Old Testament. 
It is, Gregory says, Mount Horeb, where God dwells. Does anybody remember the story of Mount Horeb? Mount Horeb is where Elijah, deeply discouraged, fleeing for his life from the wrath of Queen Jezebel, who wanted to kill him for very good reason, went to encounter God, not as a disembodied voice for a change, but face to face. If Gurgen, or you, or I, Gregory says, is ever like Elijah, depressed, discouraged, stressed, feeling persecuted, the Song of Songs is there to remind us that we are made to be passionately loved and to love passionately in return and in all of life. In different words, Gregory says, the Song of Songs is also like Mount Sinai. Same mountain, different name, different event. What happens at Mount Sinai? The law. The, law, the Ten Commandments. Sinai is where God gave Moses the old law that taught people the very lowest common denominator, the entry-level basics of human relationship 101. Don't kill your neighbor. Don't covet what he has. Don't steal. Don't lie. The new Sinai, the Song of Songs, Gregory says, enshrines the new law laid down by Christ, the law encapsulated by love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, not in a cool, detached, and intellectual way, but with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Oh yeah, and love your neighbor and yourself with that same wholehearted concentration, that same passionate, single-minded focus on the beauty and the elevation of the one you love. So for Gregory, it was very important for Gurgen to understand that there is nothing strange at all in the idea that connubial love would be enshrined in the pages of sacred scripture. In fact, he would have said, Gurgen, and by extension we, do ourselves a huge disservice by failing to take seriously its clear message that although God certainly loves us as a father, the very best, the very most perfect father, the one many of us never had, he also loves us passionately as a lover. With his own hands, he took cold clay and made it into warm flesh. And with his own breath, he gave us life. One of the most famous of Armenian carvings, I'm sure some of you have seen it, shows the moment when God cradles the head of Adam in his hand, having just created him. The second before he breathes into him, the breath of life, that first primordial kiss of which all others are the remembrance and the luminous shadow. In fact, Gregory says, no matter how deeply we enter into God's love, however fully we respond to it at level after level of immersion and release and arising, we will find that we are only at the beginning of infinity. There is always, blessedly, more love with a capital L. And so there is always more love with a small l. The song is punctuated with statements by the bride on the elusive nature of the groom. No matter how closely she comes to know him, she does not feel that she sees him fully until the end. At various points in the song, she says, my nephew put just his hand through the window. That was all I could see. He stands on the other side of a wall. He bends down to the window. He looks through the lattice, and all I can see of this person whom I love most in all of the universe is a hazy outline. No matter how clear he becomes to me. Now we see in part, St. Paul says, but the time will come 
when at ever new levels we will know even as we are known. So this evening, with our few minutes together, we have looked at just a little bit of one tiny corner <laughs> of a commentary by a great lover on the dialogue of love with a capital L and love with a small l. A commentary on the way that love with a capital L seeks to grow and increase and spread love with a small l and to elevate the beloved through love to love. A commentary that was written as an invitation to Gurgen and by extension to us not to just look on the display of love, but to dare to grow in love. Gregory read the Song of Songs as an invitation to experience loving and being loved by God, not as a detached, distant, objective concept, but as a full and unquenchable reality. It was an invitation that Gregory answered again and again and again in his own life. And we may hope that Gurgen <laughs> did the same. It's an invitation that goes on forever. As Gregory says in his conclusion to the commentary, in comparison with what the saints are going to learn of love, in their state of renewal and perfection. These things that are said by Solomon pale, as does everything else concerning all the miracles of God that have ever happened or that are ever going to happen. Everything that has been related by the ancients and by people of more modern times, no matter how capable of speaking and teaching the Lord Jesus has made them, it is all nothing compared to the love that we will learn. May all of us rise to answer that same invitation. As St. Gregory said again, may both I who have interpreted these words and you who study them participate in the things of which they have just reminded us. In these things which we have read, we do all participate forever and to the eternity of eternities.